Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season we're a little bit different. How do you as a recruitment leader and founder maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG Podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by Roger Roop van der Voort. Roger is the CEO of a company called PCN, which originally standed for the Payments Card Network, Payments and Cards Network, based in Amsterdam. They have an office in Berlin and a satellite office in the US with over 33 employees. They specialize in as being the gateway to fintech and they recruit different levels of people across fintech. Um, now, why I wanted to interview Roger is that he, um, I think he's an incredible guy. He's, he's 34 years old and he joined the business as a entry-level recruiter nine years ago with no idea what we wanted to do. He knew he wanted to be in sales, but he didn't know if he wanted to stay in sales, stay in recruitment. Um, but he got introduced to the founder and he was the first employee. So he sat next to a guy called Jordan, who was the founder and was the, the only person cold calling all day. Um, over nine years, well, eight years later, after the pandemic, he stepped into the CEO role. The founder has exited, it was not exit, he stepped away, still has a, a stake and, and has another fintech business. But Roger is firmly at the helm now with a plan to grow to 150 staff in five years um, and take all the knowledge he learned as a grassroots recruiter into this role as the CEO. Um, I think it's just incredible that whilst a lot of people do set up their own, others don't need to. Others can work next to a founder or for a founding team and have got the opportunity to step up to that CEO, to that leadership level. And so today I want to ideally inspire people that you don't have to quit and set up your own business. There are a lot of opportunities perhaps in the agency you're already in if you can spot them and take advantage. So let's get into today's episode without further ado. Roger, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. No, I'm not a problem. Ple a pleasure to have you on, on from this uh, from Amsterdam today, dialing in globally. We uh, on this heat wave. Um, how is uh, how is life for you on this? What day is it? Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Thursday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, very warm. Very warm indeed. Yeah, we're also in the, in the midst of a heat wave at the moment. But uh, yeah, other than that, all good. Just came back from a nice holiday in France myself, so uh, fully recharged to uh, yeah kick the rest of the year up the ass. Where did you go in France? South of France to Aix-en-Provence. Right. What was it? Beautiful place. Or? That's amazing. Yeah. Super warm, 36 degrees. But uh, yeah, it's a good excuse to uh, uh, lay next to the pool all day, right? And just relax. Oh, mate. Right. Yeah, I went to Turkey and it was 35. And we were on this, we had this, we had this like, apartment with it, shared pool with another family that were really nice, overlooking this unbelievable like hill with the sea. And it was just, yeah, it was amazing but the i just couldn't stop drinking beers like and i don't really drink that much <laughs> but when i'm away i was like yeah i need a 12 o'clock beer and then you, you, yeah i was like i drank i definitely drank too much when you got two kids with you as well it's like you don't you don't want to be getting to that point in the afternoon where you're like you're feeling it in the head and i was like yeah i could definitely mm. feel it. i needed to be careful drink some water in the afternoons but and i'm excited i'm off to london today i've got my business partners stag do in valencia have you been to valencia exactly never no no i'm well excited i've never been it's one of those places that everyone goes to barcelona but apparently it's you know it's really cool it's a bit like going to london or manchester valencia is like you know the second one apparently on the on the coast so well excited for that um but roger i've done a brief introduction to you i can never ever ever do it 
quite as much justice as you, you will yourself. So just a really high level, who are you right now? You, you in the job and the company. Give us that bird's eye view of PCN. Sure, yeah. So um, I'm the CEO of PCN today. Um, so uh, within PCN, we have two brands, PCN and Digital Source, and we focus on recruitment predominantly within the fintech space. Uh, so we cross uh, do that across our five pillars, engineering, delivery, commercial roles, uh, risk, fraud, and compliance, as well as product. Uh, offices in Amsterdam and in Berlin, uh, as well as a satellite, satellite office in the US. Um, yeah, and I take responsibility for many things, but um, commercial strategy and vision, I think, are the most important ones. Wow. Okay. And you, how long have you been in recruitment? For nine and a half years now. So I started nine and a half years, 2013, actually at PCN, which is then called Famous in Cars Network. So my whole recruitment career has been with this company. Wow. So how did you've worked your way up to CEO? Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I started. You ever, you ever sit there thinking, how have I done that? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems to also natural. I mean, I remember in 2013, I came in as a junior recruitment consultant. I um, was hired by the founder, a guy called Jordan Lawrence back then. And then, yeah, throughout those nine and a half years, grown, we've grown the team set up multiple offices uh, and just a trajectory uh, was there. Jordan has always given me the opportunity to step up and be at some point take over from him. And then uh, I think it's now one and a half years ago, um, he offered me the actual role of CEO. So uh, yeah, it, it, it seems to be a very fluid um, career trajectory. Um, but yeah, it's also because I've been in it myself, right? So for me, I think it's hard to take that step back and, and look at it from the outside. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a very interesting an exciting um, journey to be part of. So what made you what made you get into recruitment in the first place? Do you remember? Um, I really wanted to get into sales. So I'd done a um, project for uh, the university to do research for Dutch companies in India. So um, the project was do nine months of uh, acquisition of, of, of companies that want to do that research. So it was just cold calling all day. That's where I fell in love with cold calling. Um, and then afterwards I thought, okay, I want to do something in sales. I got referred by a former candidate of us to Jordan um, to actually talk about getting a job within the kind of payment space because that was back then our, our sole focus. Um, and Jordan said, why don't you come and interview for uh, uh, working with me? And I said, yeah, why not? I've been through the interview process. And yeah, after a few rounds, uh, he offered me so a job. And I thought, yeah. Did you just say the words, I fell in love with cold calling? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So explain that. Tell me that because I never did that. No chance. <laughs> I think it's the thrill, uh, the thrill of, 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 of calling people and getting to that. Yes, of course, it's and I really found that out when I started in recruitment. I wasn't used to dealing with so many no's. Um, mm. So it was something that I had to uh, get used to. Uh, and I think really got to know myself in uh, dealing with all that rejection. But yeah, I think it was just speaking to people, having conversations and trying to turn them around into actually doing business with you and, and getting those one out of. Yeah, in the beginning, I think it was when we just started, there was not much in place. So we was just calling all day. I think we did 50 calls every day. And maybe there was one person who had at least some sort of interest. So that was obviously the big achievement of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how I or why I fell in love with it. Wow. See, I, I, I agree with the thrill. No doubt about it. But I hated the process. I didn't enjoy the actual, fuck, I'm ringing this guy again. I just remember <laughs> looking at my screen thinking, I've got to do this. But I did it and I was I was actually pretty good at it. I mean, I remember when before recruitment, I knocked on doors for six months. So I left wow. uni as a as a graduate of a teacher type, it wasn't even a teaching course, it was a sports course. Got a job in sales because I was like, I want to earn money. Um, and I knocked on doors, signing people up for charities to direct debits for charities. And you'd knock on you'd have to you'd have to have a hundred houses in a day. You'd knock on every house maybe two or three times, you keep walking. You might speak to 25 to 30 people and then you'd look at closing and converting between four and eight. Um, so I knew kind of that was ultimate rejection, like knocking on a door and being yeah, told definitely. to like piss off or you'd have dogs chasing you down the street. <laughs> it, was, it was insane. Um, but again, the thrill when you got one was, was incredible. Then when I went, into, I went into teaching and I think teaching was a better job by a mile than that, but I see, I missed that entrepreneurial, like what what could I create today? And the thrill, the thrill of the win when you do get. So then when I got in recruitment, I found that it was a better version of what I'd done before. But I still sat there looking at the phone thinking, oh, fuck it. 
I never, I still got that nerves every time I picked up the phone to someone I didn't know. And I, I don't know. I never enjoyed it that much. I still have that nerve, to be honest. It still happens to me. So, uh, yeah, I think that, again, keeps you sharp as well, right? The increasing the kind of uh, stress levels. So, um, and I would say that kind of the um, unknowing view I had on cold calling when I started has changed. So I'd say now I'm not as excited as I am about it as I was before, uh, because I think that's just a natural uh, progression mm. that uh, I've gone through. So, um, but yeah, I think that w- what you've done knocking on doors, that, that must have been the kind of ultimate it's training horrific. school, right? I mean, you get rejected right in your face over the phone, at least yeah. Uh, when yeah. we didn't do that much video, it was only calling. So. Uh, there wasn't someone there. There was someone on the end, on the end, on the end of the line. But if you would walk to them up the street, you would not recognize them or know where exactly. they were. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it was it was pretty tough. What? So, what did the business look like when you started? And what was the name? PCM. What does it stand for? Payments? Did you say? Yeah, payments and cards network. Um, so uh, payments and cards network. Right. So it was very specific recruitment in that sector yes. at the time. And how many people were in the business at the time when you joined? That was the second one. So just you and the owner? Yeah. Right. And what was his vision that bought, what did you buy into? Um, I bought into being a niche recruitment agency specialized within an industry that I also was excited by. So my dad used to work in payments um, back then, 2013. E-commerce on the rise. There were a couple companies as well, uh, bred in the Netherlands, uh, but obviously also global. We're doing really well within the payments domain. Um, and I just liked that. And I never realized before I came into uh, working for Payments and Cars Network that when you walk into a supermarket and you do a transaction, how much is actually happening in the back in order to make that transaction happen. Um, and for some reason, that really excited me. I think that payments over the years have become more sexy than it was back then, also because it's now broader fintech and there's more happening within it. Also, there's yeah. uh, neo banks and trading apps and stuff like that that are no part, part of it. But uh, yeah, I think that that was the vision of Jordan was, okay, being the, the specialist within our field um, and offering um, and building networks of people that um, have that specific knowledge. Uh, what where type we of people was it? Like technology people or what type of people was it you were recruiting? So I'd say everyone who had a specific payments background. So everything except engineering because, yeah, engineering are more, uh, it's, it's more skills agnostic, right? So... This was really about the people who needed a payments background in order to build a certain product, in order to sell a certain service. They need to have knowledge of that payment space. So that, those are the profiles we were specializing. Okay. And and it was just you and the founder. And what what yeah. was that like having like daily access to a business owner sat right next to you or whatever? Oh, it was really inspirational. It was great to be there next to him, so see how he did the job, learn a lot from him. Um, and, um, yeah, apply the skills that I learned from him, translated them or put my own filter on it, um, and then became successful, uh, myself. So it was a great inspiration sitting next to Jordan and see how he had built the business, how I would call people. And they all knew of Jordan. Jordan had spoken to them one way or the other. Uh, I think that was super exciting to, uh, to be part of. Yeah. I think that was probably the one thing when I, um, I was at, uh, I was at Randstad when I started, which. Mm-hmm. It's just massive, right? And you don't, you know, you get you, you, there's so many management layers till you get to the CEO of Australia and the Asia Pack, and so you don't meet any of the big dogs. And the guy it was a guy called Fred Van der Tang from from Holland, who was the, yeah. the Asia Asia Pack CEO at the time. Um, when I moved to London, and I started in Venquist, which was a business transformation specialist, there was only like seven of us, and you know, the, there was two founders and a director that started the business, and they were all in the room all day. And the director was like my boss and she was incredible. And it was like, it was just another level to be able to see these people make decisions and change things and hire people and, you know, think about an office change or a system change. And I love that fluidity of a, of a, of a small startup that I don't think you get that in a bigger company. I don't think you get access to that, you know, and you can ask, you can ask so many questions and they just get answered. Like there's no, you don't have to go through layers. So that must have been to sit just you and the founder must have been incredible. Um, and how did you perform? What was your like? What was your early abilities, and how did you take to the to the to the role? So yeah, for us back then, it was just like I said, literally every day was about call, calling as many prospects as possible, um, and then continuously following up. So I was tasked with building up the uh, German market for us, or it's at least German speaking region. Um, and uh, success was measured by pulling jobs, 
like that. Can you speak German or did you do it in English? No, I did it all in English. So mm. uh, luckily back then, or, or I do speak some German, so at least I was able to get past the gatekeeper um, who were more German than, than able to speak English. So, But when you got to the business owner, then most of them would speak uh, proper English. It's quite an international industry um, and Germans are quite international themselves. Uh, yeah. That's good. How did you find it though? Did you perform well? Yeah, I mean, like I said in the beginning, it was a struggle because there was so many rejections. Like I knew there would be rejections, but not as much as uh, I would have uh, at that time. I think I did my first deal in the first six months and then it took me another three to do my second one. So yeah, steadily, but slowly uh, got more and more success. And I think I was very happy with Jordan at least seeing that he, he saw that there was potential in me. And it was not just about the deals being put on the um, um, in the system, but uh, or, or on the board, but um, also about the uh, effort I put into it and the, the joy I had in doing the job. Makes sense. And then, so talk talk me through how how it evolved. Then, as it and, and that, you know, there's two of you now. How, how many people have you got right now in the business? Thirty three. Right. So there's a big growth there. So how did that yeah. growth plan evolve? What was the what can you remember was the earliest steps that it wasn't just going to continue as you two? Uh, so I think with peaks and frauds, I think one of our first hires next to us was a guy called Charles. He was taking responsibility for the French market. Pretty quickly hired a marketing guy called Amir, who was back then an intern who set up all marketing for us. So over the years, um, we've invested quite heavily in our PCM brand. Uh, we right now have a big marketing team as well in place, about four people. Um, who do not just marketing for PCM, we'd also do podcasts, we do marketing for our clients. So there's a lot that we do with that, but that started back in, I think we hired him in 2014, with just a newsletter, which was literally um, made in PowerPoint, made on slides, and then sent out to people who were on our uh, newsletter list. Um, then we hired a, another guy called Lewis, who was setting up the UK. Um, and then it was with Peaks and Frauds. Uh, we did some uh, hires that went, went really well, some hires that didn't go so well. Um, so yeah, I think over the years, slowly but steadily, we've grown uh, until now, I'd say two years ago, we really put a kind of more structured approach in place where we set up the PCN Academy. We have new people, juniors coming in that we train ourselves um, and then make sure that they, uh, they become successful. And we've now run, I think, the first three or four programs um, and the people are doing really well. So I think it's exciting to see that, that, that investment and hiring an L&D person and putting that kind of structure in place. Uh, is helping us to scale and, and where we want to go. How long was it till you were leading people and starting to take on the reins of not just recruiting? Um, I'd say two years. I think two. Yeah, when Charles joined, um, that was the first one. So I think it was after one and a half years. That's a big ask in such a... How old are you at that point? Like 30, 25, something like that? 26? 26. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you've got yeah. a bit of, at that age, you've got the ability to kind of, you know who you are, I think, at 26, 27. You start to, that's when I moved to London when I was 26. And I think, yeah, had I had I got into recruitment at 21, I don't think I'd have been the same guy as when I got into it at 25, 26. But how, how did you find that transition into not just worried about yourself now, but taking care of others? Yeah, it was a challenge. I think every step you get to know yourself a bit better, right? So, uh, you always learn uh, about yourself. Uh, even today, um, I still learned from uh, one of your podcasts, actually. Um, but uh, so I think that that's definitely was a point where I got to know how I would deal with having people, what my management style could be like, what kind of management style do I want to have. Um, so how would um, you define that? Then? So go if we go back, what yeah. what were you? What was your earliest management style like, and what did you decide you wanted it to be like? I think I just had difficulties with delegating. Like, what do I take ownership of? How, who, how do I delegate? How do I, how do I make sure people are accountable? Uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, luckily, there was room to make those mistakes, if you will, um, and, and then learn from those. Uh, but I'd say that it now changed to, yes, yeah, just really having people be accountable, take their own responsibility, be independent, uh, rather than telling them what to do, uh, rather collaborative collaboratively come up with what it is that we're trying to achieve and then, and then work towards that. Uh, so I think that has significantly changed, but I was struggling back then. I remember that just, okay, how do I go about making sure that we hit the targets that we set up? How do we go about making sure that uh, the people are um, going to buy into what we're trying to achieve, etc. So it's been an interesting uh, learning curve. Yeah. I mean, I remember the same thing when I went from 
it was about 18 months in London and I was doing really well. I just started making fucking money. And then they were like, right, we want you to lead a person. Yeah. I, was like, I was like, I don't know if I want to. I was a bit, I don't know, a bit like, quite like what I'm doing now. I finally got it. And my deals are going in like three, four, five a month. I'm like, contractors are running. I'm getting paid. I'm like, but they were like, no, we see the potential in you. You can, you know, you can, we can, you can definitely carry on that and learn a new skill. And it's very difficult, I think, when someone you trust and who is inspirational says they see something in you to say mm. no. Um, and I'm really glad I did do that. But my first, my biggest, comp I know my biggest issue was I was like a superhero type manager or leader. So like, I would jump in and solve everything. Like I would, I was never, I never let people breathe enough to think about what they did and then make an advised decision to change it. But like, right, you need to do this, you need to do that. So what I found I was doing was just billing through people, basically. You know, I wasn't really, if I'd have disappeared the next day, especially early days, if I would, if I'd have done a day off, they'd have probably been lost because it was too like, do this, do that, do this, do that, as opposed to like getting them to, and I, and I know when people are a junior, they need a bit of that, but it, I took it way too far. And yeah. I still say now delegation is my weakest point. Like, because I think, I always think, I'm 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 putting on someone else like I'm I'm putting on them if you know what I mean I'm feel like I always feel like this responsibility to I'm just dumping on someone that's like kind of a natural thing I feel um, but reality is they can't grow you can't grow unless you do it right and yeah, they you, see it more often as an as an as an honor to do it uh, where for yeah. you it might be a tedious task for them they see an opportunity to step up right so I think that's that, that's important but to to your point on yeah, having being asked to be, okay do management, uh, I had a couple of big struggles. With people in the team at a certain point, I think it was 2016, where I just felt okay, I'm going to stop management. I can't do it. Uh, this is not for me. I don't want to do it. Um, and then I did that for about a year. Uh, luckily, someone else was able to do the growth further, and I was more commercially involved. Uh, but then Jordan said, "Look, I know you had these struggles, but I want you to try it again." And I'm very happy he did because. Um, I then said, okay, you know, if you tell me, indeed, if an inspirational person tells you, don't go and do it, give it another try, um, and you do it and it works out, um, yeah, I'm very happy that he uh, pushed me in that direction. Can you remember, did you, any incidents or scenarios where you, where you would say you made mistakes or you let yourself down? That's a very good question. Um, I don't know, I think it's... Maybe it's been the specific people. I'm sure it's also for me. I, I, I think it started with the selection process of actually hiring the people. I felt at the beginning, also to your point of being a superhero, I felt, okay, this is a rough diamond. I can turn them into a diamond, this person. Yeah. But hire them, turned out, you can't, you, you can't change them. If, they, if they're not like that, they might be great at a certain point. But yeah, if, if you, can't, you can't change them yourselves. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes I made. And that was the, one of the pr people as well, where I, I figured after that, look, I don't want to do this anymore uh, because it was just so hard. I felt like I'm good at doing recruitment. I'm good at doing deals. I'm good at speaking to clients, getting business in. So why would I focus on doing more management? But yeah, again, then Jordan pushed me. Uh, I'm pretty ambitious. So uh, that uh, then got me back into that management horse. Like it. What sort of structure did you put in place when, when you got it right? What was the level of structure you put in place for your team each week? So how much, because again, this is something I think, especially in a remote environment now, it's probably the, one of the hardest things to get right. It's like, yeah. how often do you check in? How often do you keep an eye on stats and KPIs? Like, what was your mantra? What is your mantra on, on making sure someone's got the, you know, the support, but not, you're not micromanaging, you're not stepping over that line? No, so luckily now my team is the management team and they're, they're all senior people who can uh, manage their own business. So I'm, I'm fine with checking in once a week and maybe we jump on calls every now and again for uh, if there are certain emergencies. But uh, we talk once a week about how the business is going. Uh, we're very output driven. So uh, as long as the output is going to come, uh, that's more important. I don't think, I think the, the trap that you fall into with an input-driven organization is that it becomes micromanagement. Uh, so mm -hmm. for me, it's more important. All right, what do you see happening? What's the pipeline? What are you working on? Um, is there any risks of this not uh, coming through? Um, and then start to uh, have conversations and manage in that way. Um, I think with more junior people, there you would probably 
be more if i if i look at when i had juniors it was very much okay every morning you check in at the end of the day you check in how are things going you sit next to them listen to their calls uh see what they're struggling with try to help them try to motivate them especially when you're a junior just so much coming at you so much you can learn so much you want to learn uh but almost also so much you can struggle with so uh, i think it's about making sure that you can help them understand those struggles and get through them uh because yeah it's that resilience that uh, i believe makes uh, any person really successful but definitely in recruitment no i agree i agree so talk us through the the story from going back into leadership to to the ceo how did that story progress um so uh i think when i got back into management we hired a guy called morton who is now heading up our berlin office our dach operation um that's where we started when we started uh, hiring some other people who were really focused on certain geography so we changed the structure to have teams focus on a certain geography um, and within that geography you then had country managers that then had people in their team that would lead the expansion into that country um that's still going on uh, but right now we also have more uh, specialized roles so i think specialization for us is really important in that we specialize within the fintech space so we're by no means fintech expert we definitely know what's going on in the market we know the language that candidates are talking uh, we know the, can- the language that the clients are talking um but even more granular granular to that is is giving people the opportunity especially in those first two years to look at the different aspects of the job so let's say that they're sourcing there's sales and there's account management. So in those first two years in our academy, they run through a two-year program. They get to know of all of those facets and then from there decide which they want to specialize in. So that's how we then have people who are country managers, maybe only do sales. They would have next someone next to them who only does account management and then they would have uh, sourcers. I'd say the sourcers are more often the people who come in new, uh, the new grads who come in, the trainees. Uh, and then from there, they start to grow out. Uh, but that's how yeah. we've really, over the past couple of years, have built the organization and how we feel we can now scale the organization further. Do you not have any 360 recruiters anymore? Oh, yeah, we do. We still do. I, th- I think it's um, this is something we started implementing uh, two years ago. Uh, and there's people as well who say, look, I love all aspects of the job. Uh, then we also want them to give them the opportunity to do that. I think it's important that, that there are people who understand all facets because if you speak to a client, you need to know what's going on on the candidate side and understand what the struggles might be on the candidate side and vice versa. Uh, so we still have 360 recruiters, uh, but we also have uh, certain specialists in the, in the business. Right. So, but how does that... So say you have a team. So you've got a team and they've got, you've, got a, you've got a sales manager, you've got an account manager, you've got a sourcer, and then you've got a random 360 person as well. Like how would you fit them together? So I'd say that, uh, uh, especially for the more immature markets, uh, that's where we'd have uh, more 360 people. Yeah. Um, or there's also a transition moment, right? You can't just say from one day to the next, okay, now I only do sales. Uh, there will also always be that transition going on. And I think um, for the people who've been with the business for, let's say, two plus years, there's several seniors within the business. Uh, they still have a good network of candidates. So they would still speak to candidates if they hear of a role because they have a good relationship with them rather than say, oh yeah, here, now you speak to this new person. If the relationship is there, yeah, as you know, it's a relationship-driven business, right? So uh, it's important to nurture those relationships um, and act on them, especially if you have them. Um, so that's, yeah, to your, to your question, 360 people are still in the business, especially for the more immature markets. Um, but it's not as rigid as saying, okay, you only do uh, sales if people still have a have a good network as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I think when I was at when I was at Venquist, we were all three hundred and sixty for a while, mm-hmm. and then just before I left, we had we were we had more mature teams, right? So we were, it was starting to move to that one hundred and eighty model. We we was it one? Yeah, no, it was the, exactly what you said. We had the BD guys, we had the account management guys, we had the sources. Like it's the it's quite classic way of doing it i think now when you've got a, a mature team most your mature market um they've gone and built a huge delivery center in leicester in england as well so they've got like this one big office full of sources and then they've got these satellite offices with the with the with the client facing guys um yeah. but i think it's quite a cool way of doing it it's very, definitely uh, yeah very different they've got this huge, sort of huge delivery center which i've not seen many companies do I'm interrupting today's episode to mention our sponsor. 
talent ticker are here to help everyone who are in such a candidate short market, right? So if you're looking to grow your recruitment business in 2022, so you know candidates are important and talent ticker are here to help. What they do is they help recruiters work smart and not hard. They've got over 300 agency clients, recruitment agency businesses that use talent ticker, and that helps them connect to the right person at the right time for the right reason. Okay, it also automates a lot of monotonous tasks we use and provides simple tools to identify ideal and off the grid candidates, people that are under the radar for open roles. So if you like the sound of finding more deeper level talent that's not exclusively on LinkedIn, for example, then get over to www.get.talentticker.ai forward slash Hoxo. You'll find the link in the episode. Go and take advantage of the special offer they've got on there for our listeners. You moved into that role. You, you started to, you know, you, you're seeing this growth in country management. But how, at what point was it clear that you and that Jordan was going to move on and you were going to take off? Did he? Did you always know that? Was that like a conversation you consistently had that his vision was for someone else to take his role? Like, what talk, talk us through that? Yeah, there was always an opportunity, and I think that's maybe also what I bought into when I was a 25 year old. Uh, graduate coming into the business. As Jonas said, look, I want you to at some point uh, take over the team uh, and take over the business maybe. So Jordan started his own fintech business, an open banking company called Vault a couple of years ago. Uh, so then uh, he was already slowly phasing out. Uh, and two years ago, he said officially, uh, okay, I want you to take the role and I'll step back and be more of an advisor. Um, so it was uh, something that was always there. Is he one of your biggest clients then, Vault? Are they using the, the business as a... They are an important client to us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. They must be, yeah. They should be. <laughs> um, so what, what go... Again, I can see the, I can see the attraction there because I imagine at some point in your career, if, if that option wasn't there with Jordan, you, you might have thought about starting your own business, right? As a, you might I don't know, actually. I like, think... It, I, I never expected to be in recruitment for so long. I just thought, okay, this is a nice step up to maybe go into a sales role, to maybe work for another payments company. Um, but I came to realize that there's, it's going to sound very cocky, that there's no other organization as good as ours. So I always looked, had a look in the kitchen of the other companies doing work with them, doing business with them, doing recruitment with them, or speaking to candidates who are working for certain organizations, which from the outside look very sexy and great. Then you speak to the people and you're like, no, I don't know. This is not it. And there was so much opportunity offered by Jordan uh, at PCN. That there was no reason for me to move on. But uh, yeah, if you asked me back in 2013, I would have said, look, I'm here two, three years, and then I move on. Uh, I would never have stayed in recruitment for so long. But yeah, here I am. Did you, when you say, you know, no, none of the cultures or companies are as good as ours, like what, what was it? What was in the DNA at the business that, that you feel was so special? I think it was the opportunity to shape the culture myself or ourselves uh, as a team. And I think in other organizations, I would not have had the opportunity to do that to such extent as within PCN. Um, I think uh, over the years, we've really tried to focus on uh, a certain set of values, uh, but also take care of our employees. Like, well, actually, in inspiration from your podcast, we introduced a four-day uh, work week uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and that has given... I think it has been it has had an important positive impact uh, on the culture. Uh, it has also an impact on the type of people that we hire because yeah, there is more asked for the consultants in terms of taking responsibility and ownership um, because we don't expect you to work uh, five days. It is a four day work week. Take a nice three day weekend, uh, but it does require you to put. We've not changed the the targets, for example. We've not changed any salaries. Uh, it's been important for us to say, look. There is, we feel that there is an opportunity to do our work within four days. But if yeah. you need more time, then you take responsibility and ownership of that. And then you maybe say, okay, I work extra in the evening or I work on a Friday uh, in order to make sure that I, uh, that I do that. So a very long-winded answer. Um, no, it's fine. Uh, yeah, I that's get kind it. Of, uh, so who's, whose decision was that? Yours, the four day? Uh, no, that was together with uh, our CEO, uh, Victoria, and with Jordan. So with the three of us, uh, I listened to your podcast uh, with the guys from uh, the guy from MLR, David something, I think. Yeah, 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 David Stone. That's a long time yeah. ago, that. Wow. Yeah, that's that a was long time I, ago, yeah. Uh, that was, like was 20... what, probably your first season? Mm, second season. First season was in the... First, oh, it might have been. No, no, you think you're right. I think it was the very end of the first season. I think you're right. I think yeah. it was the last episode of season one. He came yeah. into my office in, in London in Bethnal Green, and I'll never forget it. And he, uh, 
I loved him. He's such a character, David. And he's he's changed a lot in the he's lost so much weight now and he's this like new guy, but <laughs> his energy on that call was fucking wicked. Like and and yeah, yeah I, I, it was just he was like this. I think there's a company called Nicholson that I've met, John Nicholson, and they they were they were the ones who inspired him. So they were the first, and then it was him. And now it seems to be quite a lot of companies doing it. We yeah. we've adopted a four and a half day week. So I saw that, yeah. Yeah, Hock, so we finish at 12 on a Friday, which to be honest, I try and have no external meetings if I can on a Friday it's more like a, an opportunity to just catch up with the team and do some admin and think and then at 12 everyone has a really good afternoon and we um and then I mean I don't know if I'll be finishing at 12 every Friday but and if, if we work it out and it's great then I think we would introduce it to being a Thursday night but I almost I don't know I, I always have a feeling on a Friday in work that's good like I always have a really positive yeah true Buzz on a Friday morning. Maybe I'll just have that on the Thursday. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I don't. I don't know. I think the thought of finishing at lunch, it's gone down so well in our business so far. We're only a few. I'm weeks sure. Away. Yeah. It's more. Well, were you afraid to take that leap of immediately going to a four day work week? Or well, no, because our business is split into kind of two units. We've got the academy and we've got the agency. And the academy is more a bit like a, it's a bit more like recruitment that mm-hmm. is quite sales focused, and then the delivery is quite light touch. So I honestly don't think it'd make any difference if we went four days today. It wouldn't make, I mean, I would still do a bit and very mature team, whereas the agency is more, more complex like a recruitment business, but there's effectively we sell time. So we sell hours. You know, if you're buying, the way we price our product is time. So when you slice a day off, you actually slice 20% of your revenue off. Yeah. <laughs> so we've had to think about that. Whereas, that's why we've gone for the half day. So it's only, you know, we're only, and ultimately, like you said, people are, are adults. If shit needs to get done, they've got to do it. And how, so let's talk about you then. How, how have you, how have you managed to implement it? And what, what is your kind of protocols around the Friday? Is it the Friday you take? Yeah. I'm yeah, waiting yeah. for the, I'm waiting for a company to take the Monday off. I can't wait for that. that will be brilliant. Um, but tell us how, like, what's the methodology that keeps it running in your business? So the way that we approached it initially was to say, okay, let's run a trial. So I think on the mm. 1st of March in 2020, just before COVID hit, we announced to say, or we announced it in February. And then we said, look, we have a couple of weeks to adjust. And then 1st of March will officially start on a four-day work week. You run it until the end of the year. There's certain productivity KPIs we look at um, and see, okay, are they going to be in the same level or maybe even increased uh, because people uh, become more, uh, more efficient. And then after that, we decide if we're going to uh, keep uh, keep it uh, as is and, and even put it through contractually. So, yeah, so the trial was very successful. Um, and then in on the 1st of January 2021, we announced, okay, this is going to be something that we're going to do uh, for uh, eternity. Um, and what we said is um, we do it on the, so to your point on one on a Monday and, and a Friday, is that we felt that the Friday is always the day where people already maybe were productive half the day or, Maybe not even at all. They were already with their head in the weekend. Um, so we felt that this Friday wasn't probably the, the, the most used day uh, anyway. Whereas if you would do it on a Monday, then that would probably impact and you would actually turn out to have yeah, a free day. Yeah, I agree. Weekend. I agree. So, so that's why. Um, yeah, for us, so it's, it's if you want to work on a Friday, up to you, but you don't have to. Uh, again, it's important for people to do their work within four days, uh, be as efficient as they can be. Uh, if they feel the need to work on the Friday because if they need to take a client call or can they call, um, then that's up to them. We do always say, look, be available at least. If there's interviews going, make sure that you are keeping an eye out on your phone and email because if people don't show up or if there's uh, difficulties with dialing in, then m- make sure that you're on that. But uh, other than that, it's up to you to uh, to fill that in. So again, it's really yeah, giving uh, people the ownership of what their own. If, what do you do if like a client calls a job in? Or wants to do a briefing call on a Friday. Like, how do you manage that? Is it? Uh, would you make it mandatory that they they deal with it, or would would they have the option to say, "Well, I've already made plans on Friday." They have the option to say, "I've already made plans," and we, we've been very vocal about it as well to our clients. So most of our clients know we have a four day work week, and they respect that, and I appreciate. It. And they said, "Look, I don't. I know you don't work on a Friday, so happy to talk on Monday." Um, in my opinion, I don't think that that one day of taking that job, maybe a day on the Monday instead of the Friday, is going to have such a significant impact on the delivery no. of the candidate. Contract though, I think in contract recruitment in True. London, I yeah. I believe clients used to try and piss us off. I I believe this, right? Because I swear to God, 
there were certain clients who would always release a job between four and five on a Friday. They fucking loved it. And they knew, and they'd CC you into the other agencies they were sending it to. So you were like, I've got to fucking work this now. So you'd literally be like packing up, you'd be going to the pub, and then you'd be like, I'm sorry, guys, I've, I'm two hours at least. I've got, to. and you would be scrambling to like secure candidates so fast so that you weren't going to come in on Monday and the job was dead. Um, and I used to hate, I mean, probably in today's world and how I think now, I would have just said, I don't want to work with that client anymore because it's clearly they have, or I'd ask them, I challenge them and go, could you start releasing it on a Monday? And just, you know, you, you, it's really not, there's no difference to you if we, work like a lunatic on a Monday morning rather than a Friday night. Yeah. Um, I would have, had, I'd have the confidence now to raise it. Whereas then I just used to suck it up and deal with it because of the age and the sort of role I was in. But it is mad. I think as you get older and more experienced in business, you, you do see the bigger picture so much quicker than you did when you started. Like the fear when you start around making mistakes or if I don't deliver this or if I don't do that. And so it's nice to have someone like you, I think in the business that's been there right through for everybody else because if you confidently say look this is how we're going to do friday like they they're going to feel that they're not going to feel that you know it always is a top-down mindset if you feel if they feel that you're into it and you believe in it then why won't it work you know Um, it's when businesses dip the toe in something and the owner's not sure that's when i don't think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna stick totally yeah lead the charge yeah for sure so that's pretty cool. So in terms of the transition from Jordan, you mentioned another CEO that was there a lady who was a CEO as well. No, COO, sorry. Victoria. COO, right. Yeah. So you, how do you transition and take over a founder's job? Like talk us through what went into that process. Because you could, again, it wouldn't have been an overnight thing. What, what did you guys have to do to make sure that it was smooth and you were prepared and as prepared as you could be, right? Yeah, so I think in all fairness, the whole transition already happened before that. So, like I said, Jordan had already slowly phased out and I had taken over responsibilities. Jordan had made to other people known that I was back then, the before I became the CEO, the COO. Um, so he already referred people to talk to me, clients, uh, candidates. Within the business, I was the most visible or more visible person compared to Jordan. So people knew of it already. Uh, it was more of a title change. So... It's hard to describe the, the exact transition in that, okay, this happened from one day to the next. Um, it was more something that happened over, I'd say, nine to 12 months, uh, maybe. And again, something Jordan has always been vocal about, um, in that he wanted me to, to step up and, and take on the business at some point, not just to me, but to uh, everyone else as well. So uh, it didn't come as a surprise either uh, to the people uh, within and uh, outside of the business. Right. So it sounds, but so there's a lot of work went in. You, you led it before you even became CEO and then you got the announcement. Um, yeah. So how did, it, how did it feel when you, when you became the CEO, when it was official and he was, he was stepping back? How did you feel? Oh, it was a big honor, first of all. Uh, I was very honored that he asked me um, and that he offered me the opportunity to step up and, and take over his, his baby, which he still is, uh, the PCN. So... Um, I was very honored. Um, other than that, it was also great to yeah, basically step up and now have the ability to really own the vision, own the uh, way that we wanted to go, um, own the decisions that I make um, and that I was making back then. So, but yeah, most importantly, it was very much an honor to be asked by the founder to take over his job. And this was around the COVID time? Just after. It was... Uh, this was now it's April 2021. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did you did you navigate COVID with him or were you on your were you still were you leading the business at that point? Um together with him, uh definitely. But yeah, he was already had his head into Vault 2. So uh, for him it was more of a split job. Uh, I put my full focus on getting us through the uh, the COVID times. And what what did what what changed in your business? You already had the four day week, which I wonder how that how did that go when you hit you, you announced something like that and then you hit COVID? Was that a blessing because things slowed down? It was actually like, well, it's probably going to be a bit easier. Or what, talk us through that situation. Uh, I think that was um, we were. I mean, in hindsight, now I think it was the right time to do it. 
when we were in the middle of it, uh, we were not sure if we were going to able to um, gather the data that we want in order to decide, can we make a judgment on the continuum with the four day work week or not? Because some of the uh, productivity metrics that we put in place were in line with uh, our KPIs, candidates being introduced, interviews, jobs being pulled, et cetera. And of course that was well, at least for a good month or two, just completely frozen uh, and came to a halt. Um, so yes, so it was in general, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, at the start of the COVID. Um, and from what I remember, the four day work week didn't add or take away from that. And what about the culture of, of like where you work and how you work? What was it like before COVID? And what's it like now in terms of office based, etc.? Um, so it was back then, it was full time being in the office, first of all. So we changed that completely to a hybrid model. But I say we were also more uh, reactive to the markets, to our clients, to the things that were happening. Um, I think now we've been through uh, a couple of these. Well, the, this was probably the biggest crisis we've we've been through. Uh, and we took a learn from it in that you have to be more uh, proactive. I think what might come up um, in terms of an uh, economic recession in the next couple of months. Um, now, having been through that COVID, um, it's easier to see the signs. Of course, also COVID came more expected, but also how to act on them. Um, and having people who are constantly doing uh, visit development rather than because just before COVID hit, from what I remember, it was also great times. There was lots of hiring going on. The yeah. economy was doing really well. So as a business, we were doing really well. Um, and then that came and I think it exposed us to the weaknesses we had in the business. One of them being, yeah, you're, we're just basically too reactive. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, you're not thinking far enough ahead. Um, no, but I think right it also now, showed, Go on. sorry, I was going to say it also showed some of the, the strengths that we had as a business in that we were able to still, we didn't have to let go of anyone because of some sort of uh, financial constraint that we have, because we have built the business financially to be healthy and to bridge that gap of those few months where business didn't come in. Um, and I think that has been probably one of the biggest trends that I've seen back then. And something that we continue to do um, is that we are not, um, we've not hired, uh, we've not overhired, uh, which would expose us in case that the market does go down. Um, and I think that's a huge strength, strength as a business. I think just several business owners I've heard on the podcast, but also that I read on uh, on LinkedIn and in the news. Unfortunately, you had to let go of people for different reasons. And uh, luckily, we were fortunate enough to uh, not have that situation. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few months either. There's been a hell of a lot of hiring going on, right? There's people mm. been banking on fucking the times are good and let's get as many as we can in and load it, load it, load it, load it. What are they going to do if it does slow down? I, I, yeah. Well, what, what are you seeing right now? So to truth, honest today, what is your business looking like? Is it, has it had any impact yet? Are you seeing any change in the, in the economy or any change in your activity based on what's what all the scaremongering that's going on in the economy? Not yet, no. So I also believe that recruitment is maybe also the effect on recruitment is always a bit delayed on both ends. So when a crisis hits, then the crisis hits, and there still might be enough work. And then after a few weeks or months is when actually recruitment starts to feel it. And the other way around, when the economy picks back up again, it takes a few months for recruitment agencies to uh, really take benefit of that. Um, this far, we've not seen. I think what we should be aware of and something that I uh, read about on one of uh, Craig Savage's blogs is when candidates start to say, I am not sure if I want to move or not because of the situation, I think that's when we start to have, uh, need to be scared. Yeah, I read uh, the same thing. I read the same yeah. thing. It's a really good point. Have you seen any of that yet? Not yet, no. Or at least not that I heard of. Um, but uh, I'm sure it'll come. And there will always be uh, people who say, look, uh, I am maybe going to stay put just because I'm not sure of the situation. But I mean, the opportunity is still there, especially within the market that we operate in, within fintech and maybe even payments. More specifically, people will continue to pay. People will continue to buy. It's not as if people start stop no. doing anything when a crisis hits. And there will be companies that will be thriving, uh, companies who will unfortunately not be thriving anymore. But um, I think there's still lots of opportunity. Even when a crisis hits, it doesn't mean that everything goes down. No, 100%. I think from what I'm hearing, most people are saying that they're expecting it to normalize it was a it was a yeah. ridiculous market for oh, a long yeah. time, and now it'll it'll level out. But is it going to go from where we were to in like dire straits? And no, no, I don't think so. I really, I think there's too much money in the system. I think there's too much. Yeah, we're not. We're not. It's not purely a financial crisis that's created this. It's a lot of the COVID backlog and the 
you know, the inflation rises to pay for what's all the all the loans and things. I don't know. I, I don't see it being absolutely catastrophic. I think there's you've got to be prepared for it getting harder. It's it's a it's a balance, isn't it? Because like the more you talk about recession, the more chance of it happening because yes. people are thinking that way. But if you don't talk about it and it bites you on the ass, you're you, you're naive. You know, you're pretending the world's great, and it's like at some point you got to address it. So we're in that weird limbo now where everyone's expecting this change, and actually they're not feeling it. But like you say, it could take time. What will yeah. what what your kind of mindset towards it? If things change, and it does get like increasingly more difficult to attract candidates to roll or move candidates, as well as roles start to slow down. What will be your approach this time? Like you said, you're more proactive. You've been through it now. What would you do? Yeah, I think that luckily as a business, we are uh, quite agile uh, in the sense we are 33 people. So if the market changes, we can also quickly adapt uh, as a company. Um, I think the uh, value pitch that we add to our clients would change. So now it's about, okay, you can't find the candidates. Well, we do this 24-7, so we can definitely help you find those candidates. We have good networks. Flips the other way around, let's say that there is still candidates who will be active, but the market over floods with candidates, so it becomes more of a client-driven type of market. Then it's the, the pitch is more about, again, okay, I'm sure you get hundreds of applicants. So let us help you uh, sift through these candidates and qualify them. Um, make sure that you can spend your time elsewhere because they will also be in some sort of crisis mode, I'm sure, uh, within, the, within the company that needs attention. Um, but I think for us, it's about becoming them more um, sales focused um, as well as account management focused than we are. I think right now it's more heavily focused on sourcing candidates um, and there is still business development going on because, yeah, again, you need to make sure you keep developing uh, relationships and especially in times like this, it's a great time to develop those relationships. Um, but if that switches, then I think it would mean more emphasis for people to start doing more business development and sales. Uh, and maybe then the specialization model I talked about earlier uh, would be put on the back burner. And we ask everyone to uh, be more on the case with regards to uh, speaking to uh, to new people. Um, luckily, we have, as a business, uh, a good name. Luckily, we have, we're constantly visible with things such as podcasts, with webinars and stuff like that. So I think we'll always have a, have a strong foundation within the fintech space. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we need to put the effort behind in order to make it work. Makes sense. Makes total sense. And so what is the vision? You know, you've been going, uh, well, you've been there nine years. You've been in the seat for best part of oh, just over a year that you've, you've led this business. What are you, what, what's your long-term vision now? Or can you tell us where you're heading? Yeah, so I think what we uh, want to be and trying to be is the gateway to fintech for uh, people. So what we've seen from... Uh, there's different ways of approaching that to be being the gateway to fintech. So it's for, if you look at other industries, look at FMCG, for example, financial services. Uh, these are normally big companies. They have traineeships. They have active campus recruitments. They get new people in to become part of their company. Fintech is super exciting, but I don't think a lot of people know how to get into the fintech space. So I think we as a company, can we, their gateway, build programs around that, build trainees around traineeships around that with our clients, but also offer the opportunity for our people once they've been through our sales academy, been successful with us, go into and work for some of our clients. Like we've had a few of those examples um, and we want to capitalize on that further. But um, it also goes well with uh, being the gateway to fintech for our candidates who are maybe already within the payments and fintech space, but working for other fintechs and for clients about getting that gateway to, to fintech talent. And that's really our vision to be that kind of um, I love it. player within the, uh, within the ecosystem. Do you have any kind of like quantifiable metrics like you want to reach this headcount or this revenue or do you have any of those things in place definitely yeah so i'd say those are more goals so in five yeah. years from now we want to be with about 150 people uh and bring in about 40 million in revenue and that wow. will be mainly coming from europe and the us then we have different business lines firm we have pcm projects which is our um uh, contracting division and then we have pcn internal which is our uh, rpo model wow and you've got to think about the agility of your business would be very different then. Oh yeah, absolutely. So like, yeah. Do you ever feel does that does that fill you with a little bit of anxiety ever to think, well, the more the bigger we get, the harder we can fall. You know, you've got a. Do you ever, as a CEO, you you know, you, do you ever feel that way? No, not not really. I think, of course, it's something to be aware of, but um, I'd say I'm a very positive-minded 
uh, person, and that came from Jordan because he he radiates positivity. So I got that from them. It's it's being always being entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, opportunistic, um, and looking at where can we go as a business. And there's multiple ways that lead to Rome. So if we're 150 people and something happens, for sure we can ch- steer the ship and maybe go go elsewhere. It might be a bigger ship to steer. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that will be successful one way or the other. Of course, difficult decisions will need to be made. And of course, there will be peaks and frauds. But uh, yeah, that's something we've seen over that I've seen over the last nine years, too. Um, and something that doesn't necessarily scare me yet. Do you, do you like how, how much like how do much do you enjoy the job that you're in now? What do you think? Like, how would you describe you, the way you feel about being the CEO and the actual day to day activities? Um, I mean, I love it. I think it's. I never thought of liking a job so much as I do now. Uh, it's great wow. to be yeah, leading the charge of a company like PCN, being surrounded by the people we have in PCN, seeing the opportunity is there, operating within the uh, industry, speaking to clients and candidates, uh, especially, of course, when they say that they love our service. Uh, that's great to hear. Uh, but it's great to be part of that and being the face of that. So, uh, yeah, there's, I absolutely love it. It's amazing. I mean... For someone who didn't even know they were going to stay in recruitment for more than a few yeah. years, I think you're running a firm now. Um, and it is, you know, you, you said to told me before, 34 years old, it's a, it's a big role for someone of your age. And it's an ama- there's not many sectors you get that opportunity, I don't think, to go in less than a decade to go from a trainee to the CEO. It's not, I, I, that's what I love about this industry. You know, yeah. you can do, you can meet, the meteoric rise can be incredible. Um, what, like you say, you're a positive person. You told us you're expecting your first child, which is amazing. You're married. How, how do you balance your time and yourself to make sure that you're not just PCN, 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 and you drop the ball elsewhere in your life when it comes to things like family, relationships, health, mindset? What, talk us, tell us about your kind of vision and approach to that. So I follow a pretty rigid uh, day plan every single day. Um, that helps me stay on top uh of my game to make sure that i work within the set hours that i want to work and i mean it's it's sometimes very fluid right private life and personal life i'm sure that if you uh, sorry private life and business life uh, i'm sure if you talk to my wife milka then she'll probably talk about some instances where i just can't stay away from my phone in order to answer emails whilst we are doing something together yeah um so th- that still still happens but uh yeah for me it's really important to have what's a- your day plan tell us about that day plan so um, I wake up every morning at a quarter to six, uh, then go for um, a little meditation of about 10 minutes, then go to the gym, um, and then my day starts. So I take breakfast, uh, make breakfast for, uh, for Milka, walk the dog, uh, get to the office, um, and then my day differs. So it, before the day ends, every single day, I make my day plan for the next day with regards to, uh, to work. What is it that I want to achieve? What do I do uh, on an hourly basis? Um, and that helps me really to uh, yeah, be structured and make sure that I split that time between family uh, and business or PCN as much as possible. And do you work in the office every day or work from home? What's your your own strategy around that? I work in the office most days. So right now I'm at home, but uh, I w- most days work in the office. Uh, just because there's always people there, uh, I think it's important to show my face. Uh, and I like being surrounded by people. I like working from home every now and again. It gets helps me get stuff done and be a bit more focused. But I also love being around the people, hear them speak to people, talk to them about what's going on. Um, coach them where necessary. So, uh, yeah, uh, majority of the time I'll be in the office. And how far are you from the office in Amsterdam? 10 minute uh, bike ride. Are you on a, are you one of the cyclists like everyone else? Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 It's just crazy how many bikes in that city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of getting a bike. I'm thinking of finally doing it. When I lived in London, I wanted to get one and then I saw someone get knocked off pretty badly and I was like, yeah. So I'm dangerous. Not yeah. In London, it's like with the buses, the way they pull out, I'm like, whereas where I live now, I'm like 20, 20, 25 minute walk from the office. So if I run it, I can run it in 12 minutes. I can drive it in five. But I feel like I'm thinking, because I live on the edge of the, the countryside, the Peak District, I'd love to... One of my close mates has got a bike and he goes out on the weekend and does some really long rides. So I think that'll be something I invest in in the next 12 months, getting a bike. Yeah, nice. Not necessarily for commuting, but more from a fitness and just getting out and about perspective. Um, good. It's mad because we used to have that office in London, a bit like you, where and I had that routine where I got up, gym, office, and then we got rid of it. And now I don't even live, I'm like 100 miles away, so I couldn't even do it if I wanted to. Um, so we've evolved our business in a different way. 
And there's times where I'll be honest, I get so jealous and think, fuck, I should have stayed in London and done that. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, we've got a South African team. We've got people in Portugal, people in the UK, all over. It just, you know, we've evolved it our own way. I'm quite similar. I get up every morning about six and usually go for a run or go to the gym or both. Try and get it out of the way, dogs, and then work. It's, it's just it's so, so important to me. If I don't get the day right at the beginning, I'm just like, I feel different. And when I get back from my run or gym, usually the kids are getting their breakfast. And again, they are mental in the morning. Yeah. Their energy levels are just insane. And I find if I don't exercise before I see them, I'm not as good. Like I'm not as patient. I'm not as fun. I'm a bit grumpy. I'm a bit like, oh, I've just woken up and you know, you're asking me a million questions. But if I've been out and I've ran and I've listened to a podcast or music or I've been to the gym, when I'm I'm already in, I'm already on their level. So, you know, I'm a lot more relaxed and fun and yeah, it's crazy. I think it's more important now I live with children than before. Like before I'm sure. When I lived on my own in Manchester, I used to say I had this routine, but some days I'd be like, well, I'm just gonna sleep in a bit. Whereas now I'm like, I ain't got a chance. I can't afford to sleep in a bit. It's not good. Um, Roger, it's been a pleasure. It's been an hour. That's gone so quick. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, what I love about this story, I mean, there's, there's different things, right? There's the, there's the four-day work week. Um, there's the growth from trainee to CEO. Because again, the show is often the founder. And, it, and, I, and I want it to be that, right? I think the founder story is incredible and important, but I love these, these every now and again, I interview someone like you that's become the CEO. In, it's that entrepreneurial journey because yeah. it isn't, recruitment isn't about everyone's breaking off and starting a firm in their underpants. Like it just doesn't have to be that way. You can, you can be really successful and grow a great business by staying with the founder and taking over and all the things you're doing. So I hope it'll inspire some people to perhaps stay where they are and, and grasp the opportunity that's in front of them rather than starting again. Yeah, absolutely. No, like you said, I think that's the great thing about recruitment uh, is that you can really own your own uh, career success and uh, trajectory. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope that I'm, I've been inspirational to some of your listeners. But it's been great to be on the show and, and thanks for the opportunity. Anytime. Well, look, if anyone does want to reach out to you, LinkedIn, a good place to drop you a note? Absolutely, yeah. Look it. And you, are you hiring right now? I'm sure you are. Yes, also. Yeah. So if any experienced recruiters are listening, want to work for PCN, four-day work week, get on, get on board. Um, Give us a shout. Yeah. Well, let's get you on again in the future. Let's see how, how let's see if, I mean, will I be doing this podcast in five years? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Let's, <laughs> let's see how we are in a couple of years and see how you are from 33 to 150. If you're in the middle, we're on track, right? Exactly. Yeah, that'd be good. So let's do that. Sorry, All right, buddy. Man. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2000 recruiters right now both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level, individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn and would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week. That's live on LinkedIn. I'll see you soon.